And I said, I see evangelists, and I see pastors, and I, I see teachers. But I said, where are the apostles and the prophets? And he answered best he could with the understanding that we had for the moment. And he said, well, um, when we send a missionary out, they're a sent one. And so they're apostles. And I said, okay. It seemed a little bit, uh, like, it seemed a little bit more foundational, though, in my mind, and what I had read for me to readily accept it. But I, I said, okay. I said, well, what about the prophet? And he said, well, every Sunday, every, every Sunday before I release the word to the people, I pray all week that I would just say what God wants me to say. And I say it, and that's prophetic. And I said, well, I can see that, but it seems like there's more because the apostle and the prophet, the Bible says that they are foundational to the church. And, and, we're, and we're having to speculate about what they might be. It didn't seem right to me. But what was really exciting was I was asking the, him this at about 1989. I was probably 20 years. No, I don't. Let me get my numbers mixed up. It was a while ago. And 1989. But that's, God had already started to raise up these ministries once again. And so it didn't take long where I connected with somebody who was a prophet. And, and he saw the prophetic in my life. And God connected us. And something began to develop. And it's because the prophetic grace, the prophetic grace of God that's on the life of a prophet, it's something that's supposed to be imparted to the people of God. And so that's my desire, it's my passion to see the prophetic imparted in your life. So it's exciting sometimes when somebody realizes for the first time that, and we'll look at the scripture in a second, when they begin to realize for the first time that not only are they invited to prophesy, they're commanded to seek after it. Let's look together to 1 Corinthians 14, and I'm going to start with verse 1, and then I'll be reading 29 through 33. So we're going to be in 14, but we're going to do a leap from verse 1 to 29 to 33. So verse 1 says this, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Then it talks in 29, it says, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one. Who can prophesy? All. Oh. You're all y'all. You're part of all y'all. Amen? That's you. Can everybody just say, uh, for my sake, um, can you all say, I can prophesy? I heard you admit it. <laughs> but now we want to see that activated in your life. Amen? You may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So tonight I want to open up this time... I want to do two things tonight, all right? The first thing I want to do is get you very excited about prophesying. Very convinced that you can, that you should, and that somebody's going to be blessed by it. I want to convince you that it's okay to eagerly desire it and to put away some of the lies of the past that we've been taught from long ago. But then also, the second thing I want to do, after I get you very, very excited... And we're just ready to go. The second thing I want to do is to give you some guidelines about how to properly function in the prophetic. And the reason I do that is because a lot of times we get geared up, we get excited, but we forget. God has given us this powerful gift. But in giving that to us, he, there's a requirement of us to use care in the gifts of God. Amen? We must use care in all of the gifts of God. So I want to talk about three characteristics that must be in your life to start a pure river of the prophetic in and out of your spirit. All right, the first characteristic that you need, it was the first thing that Paul addresses to the Corinthians, in, at least in uh, this passage. The first characteristic is love. 
It's important to start with. Uh, it's important to start the beginning of First Corinthians 14 with that, because the Spirit of God needs to deal with our hearts first. Needs to deal with our attitudes. Needs to do a deep work within us. He desires to do that. He says that the first thing to do is to pursue or to follow after love. This is right after what? First Corinthians 13. Who knows First Corinthians 13? We love it. We love the love chapter. <laughs> it's great. We read it at all our weddings. And we, it's, uh, it's an important chapter. But do you know, did you ever notice where it is situated in the Bible? Right between 1 Corinthians 12, which talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and 1 Corinthians 14, which gives further instruction on the gifts of the Spirit. So all throughout this, the Holy Spirit through Paul emphasizes you've got to love one another. I don't know if any, well, I know Pastor Jesse does. But there was a band named Whiteheart, and I think maybe they still play. Who, who remembers Whiteheart? They were great. Look them up on Apple Music. They're great. But uh, they had a song called Baby with Power Tools. And sometimes it might seem like that's what's happening in the church. It's, it's, it's like a baby with power tools. You know, you would not entrust your child, your toddler, with uh, with some kind of a power tool, a chainsaw to get something done. No, we don't even trust them with scissors. We tell them, don't run with the scissors. It's a, and so with power tools, you know, it's, it's, it takes some training, some understanding, some maturity to use it. And it's the same in the spirit to a degree. Now, we've got to know that a huge amount of maturity is not always required to prophesy, but one thing that is required is a pursuit of love. Um, even babies can talk. They can begin to speak at an immature level. But uh, we recognize, one of the things that we emphasize in the teaching when it comes to the prophetic is that your foundation has to be a foundation of care for other people, of love for other people. If you don't, then it, you are operating with something that's powerful, but you could hurt somebody. I don't even want to ask you to raise your hand if I ask how many of you have ever been hurt by a prophetic word. But I bet you I'd see almost most... I'd say almost every hand. And that's very unfortunate. And you know what's, the, uh, a very, you know what's um, also important to know? That that was very preventable. It didn't have to happen. And if we are Christians that are operating in love one for another, we can release a prophetic that really only builds up, encourages, and edifies. It doesn't do damage to another person. So that's the first characteristic. It's love. An unloving believer with an unrefined gift of prophecy is one of the most dangerous forces against the local church. I want to say that one more time. An unloving believer with an unrefined gift of prophecy is one of the most dangerous forces against the local church. People who don't begin to learn the love of God before they start to prophesy will do damage to others. They'll tear them down. Why? Because they're projecting their own hurt into their life. And God uses whoever he wants to use. But just like Dr. Wynn said on Sunday, he said that a lot of times prophets are people who have gone through some rejection. They've gone through some stuff. And not only rejection in, in churches... But also, just it seems like the enemy knows how to attack a prophetic person with rejection in their youth and in their young life and in different ways. And he does that because he really just wants to stop the grace of God and the gift of God in your life. But you don't have to let him do that. Amen? We just need to allow God to reform our hearts, take the heart of stone and make it soft like clay, Give us a heart of love for one another. A lot of times when people are prophesying, they prophesy out of that hurt. They prophesy out of uh, situations and out of mistrust and all of these things. And so one of the first things, if you ever recognize that that's happening in your life, you need to get with God. You need to allow 
leadership to speak into your life. And you need, and, and because we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't mean you are disqualified. God can still heal this. God can still make it whole. Amen? God is able. So the second characteristic, and I love this, it's desire, right? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, after it's talking about love and having the right heart set, it says, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. He is emphasizing the prophetic here. He is emphasizing, emphasizing that, uh, that people ought to seek after that. Now, I remember when I was a young man, I was taught by uh, leadership, they actually use this phrase, and you have heard this as well, most likely if you've been in the charismatic Pentecostal uh, circles for any amount of time. They said, seek the gift, not the giver. Who's heard that? Seek the gift, not the giver. There is a Greek word for this. It's balonos. <laughs> That's not a true statement. A better way to phrase it is seek the giver above all else, but then eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Yes, we seek Jesus first. That's Christianity 101. It ought to be, right? Seek God first. Seek the kingdom. Seek first his kingdom, and uh, all these things will be added to you. We know this, um, but because people were beginning to stir, get stirred up towards being used by God again, it seems like there's always a knee-jerk reaction by some leadership. They're always like, whoa, 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 don't get too excited. <laughs> Are you tired of being told not to get too excited? I can get excitable sometimes, and it's okay. Amen. It's okay. They say, don't get too excited. I know that I was just talking to a woman of God who's interested in prophetic things. She's got a circle of friends. But she says, every time I bring it up to these friends, they always say, yes, but there are false prophets. When she says something about this prophet or that, yes, but there are false prophets. Yes, there are false prophets. But we don't throw out the good because of the bad. Amen? We need to be, we need to be discerning as the body of Christ. And I might talk about false and uh, true and false more in the upcoming weeks, but a lot of times we think a false prophet is just somebody who gets details wrong or gets something wrong. It's not the case, right? It's like uh, Dr. Wynn says, there is good prophecy, there is false prophecy, but then there is wrong prophecy, right, or poor prophecy. If somebody had released something wrong, it does not necessarily make them false. A person that is a false prophet is more interested usually in what's in your wallet than what's in your heart. They're looking for, you know, they're, they're looking to meet selfish gains by representing a gift. So I got really excited as I found some teaching on YouTube about the prophetic a few weeks back and I thought, well, I'm going to see what this man has to say. And then as I clicked on the link, don't trust everything you hear on YouTube. <laughs> I clicked on the link. I saw that he's traveling with, or he's been in meetings with this very well-known minister. So I thought, wow, he must be, must be the real deal. And I said, listen to these two video series to find out how you can get addresses of people when you're ministering he gets addresses of people. He'll tell you your address. He'll tell you your bank account number. He'll tell you all these different things. Last four of your social. And it's, it's a sign. And I, and I do believe that happens in some circumstances where it's a sign from God. It doesn't happen in my ministry. Um, but uh, it, it happens in his, apparently. And so I'm like, well, let me hear what he has to say. I don't have an interest in this happening, you know. And, um, but I'll, I'll see what he has to say. And so you listen to it, and... and uh, what he ends up telling you is this. He says, in order for this to happen in your life, you have to sit under a spiritual father who does it as well. And he says, I'll be that father. How can I be that father? Send me your offering. That worried me. 
I thought I can be done with this video now and go on to something different. And I listened to a series by Jesse Enns right after that. But uh, I needed the refreshing truth. <laughs> you can thank me for that plug later. And so, but that's concerning because that's really the false. You know, and when they're talking about in Scripture, and Jesus is talking about wolves and sheep's clothing, they're looking to take a bite out of the, out of the sheep. Amen? They're looking to take a piece. They're looking for your, you to follow them and for your loyalty and for all of this ultimately so you can support them. And it's, it's not about the things of God and it's not about raising you up as a prophetic person, but it's about taking from you. But there's false prophets. But thank God for the real prophets that are operating on the earth today. And there may be time where even some of the most well-known of them release something that's out of time or wrong. You know, it doesn't seem to be right. But he told me Donald Trump would be president. What's going on? You know, there's these, there's these things that happen that, that kind of leave things in the air. But uh, it doesn't make them a false prophet. It just means that uh, there's something going on that we're, we don't know about. And uh, that's not what we base true and false on. That's a whole nother teaching. We'll get into that more, I promise. So it's okay. You don't have to be fearful. Wow, what if I get into the prophetic? I say something wrong. I'm a false prophet. They're going to stone me. That's what they do with false prophets. It's not going to happen at Antioch International Church. You won't get stoned at Antioch. You better not get stoned at Antioch International Church. You won't, I promise. Um, so when we're talking about desire, the Greek word here is zelo. And it means to covet earnestly. So this is the only time in Scripture where we're ever given permission to covet something. Right? Where you, you want that more than... You, you don't sleep at night because you're thinking, God, I want you to develop an ear for me to hear you so I can be effective to bless others and I can follow your lead Lord, I'm zealous after this. It means to be jealous over. These are all words that we usually stay away from, right? Envy, jealousy. The Bible's telling me we don't have to be worried about those words when it comes, when it comes down to the prophetic. We can be hungry after those things. It's okay. Because that's, what, that's when God starts to release things into your life, when you're, when you're passionate after it. Yes, you love Jesus more than anything else. You put him first. But he says, be passionate after this. Because when you do, the Lord responds. There's no scriptural room for a passive stance when it comes to the prophetic. You can't just say, well, that's all right for Chuck. That's all right for somebody else. It's, it's, it's all right for Brother Kumar. They can be prophetic, but I'm not going to do it. You can't be passive like that. Because the Bible is very clear. You need to actively engage after it. God wants all his children involved in the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy without exception. That's you. All right. So the third characteristic that I want to talk about tonight is not in my notes. The third characteristic. It's a wonderful characteristic. Faith. It is in my notes. I just wrote it backwards. Faith is the third characteristic. Faith. So this is how the prophetic comes into being. God can do anything. Amen? He can sit down with you, have a cup of coffee, like the memes on Facebook, and talk to you, but he chooses not to. He can speak to you audibly. If I ask anybody ever heard the audible voice of the Lord, I'll see some hands. You can raise your hand. An out loud voice of God. He can do that, but it's not the way that he usually does things. It's, not, it's un actually uncommon for him to speak to man audibly. It's one of the highest forms of revelation that we receive. It's relatively uncommon. Why? Because God is spirit. So when God speaks, he speaks spirit to spirit. 
He wants to speak to your spirit. And how does he do that? Because God will drop things in your spirit, and unless you are listening, you may not even know. But this is the key. The Bible says, let him who prophesy, prophesy according to his faith. Faith is the key to get the word of God from your spirit, man, into your understanding. So that you can release it in whatever way God wants you to release it. Faith. You've got to start to believe, yes, God is speaking to me, and I can hear him. You've got to start to tell yourself that, to be convinced of it. When you're in prayer, expect, what's God going to say? What am I going to hear today? And yes, you know my stance on this, that you hear first through the scriptures. That's, uh, that, that's the primary way that God speaks, but also never Come, never contradicting scriptures, he'll speak to you a now word as well. But it takes faith to receive it. And you've got to tr trust that he's going to uh, give you something each day. He speaks to our spirit. But it has to get from spirit to understanding. And that's the wonder of dreams. Because he can kind of bypass. You see, when we hear God, it always has to go through a filter. Do you know that you all have a filter, whether you like it or not? Your filter, of your, your understanding. You know, I talk to people that they don't even want me to call God Father. They're like, my dad was terrible. My father was terrible. I have trouble using. So some of the things that God tries to do in them is filtered through that. There's some, there's some people that just because of the abuse of their life and the things that they've been through, if you've been manipulated mentally and things like that, it causes you to have a filter that at times makes it hard or a challenge to hear the voice of God. So in dreams, a lot of times God can just bypass that. How many of you would say it's your primary way to hear God through dreams? There's a few here. It's one of the primary ways that God speaks to you. And there are dreamers here. You're called, it's the way that God and, and, but as prophetic people, we need to learn to overcome our filters. We need to learn to break those things down. And the healing power of God will destroy those areas of pain in our life and help us to hear God for what he's truly saying. All right. God is spirit. He speaks to our spirit. And when we believe it, he'll speak into our hearts. So faith is a, necess a necessary part of it. And one of the exciting aspects of faith is that faith can be built. Right? Doesn't the Bible say that? How does our faith increase according to Scripture? By hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Right? So you can build your faith. You don't have to just rem remain, um, you don't have to remain where you are in your faith level. And as your faith increases, the strength of the prophetic in your life will increase. So I just gave you a huge key on how to increase the prophetic in your life. Some of you are at a point where you've maybe stepped out a few times and you say, I don't know if, if I'm even hearing anything. I don't know if... The, look into the scripture at how to increase your faith. Reading the word. The Bible says we build up our most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. You're like a walking Bible. Praying in the Holy Spirit. These different things build up our faith. And so when our faith is built up, then we have a confidence in God that when we hear him, we can release what he's saying to another individual. You have to believe it. All right. So one of the things that I want to do to build your faith is to convince you that you can prophesy. There's been a lot of teaching in script, uh, out of the scriptures and some taken out of context, some taken just alone and without other scriptures to speak into it, that have convinced a lot of people that they are not eligible to prophesy. When the Bible says that all may. So if you look at who was a candidate and who prophesied in scripture, I'm going to go through this quick. There's no need to look this up. This is something I share with my prophetic class. The following people prophesied in scripture. Sons and daughters, that was, it was told to us that they would prophesy, Acts 2, 16 through 18. 
The believers in Ephesus prophesied. You can see that in Acts 19, 2 through 6. Children, Joel 2, 28 through 29, and Psalm 8 through 2, or 8, 2 rather. Get this one. This is going to blow some of you away. Women prophesy. And they prophesy a lot in Scripture. And many women are uh, designated as prophetesses. Do you know what the difference between a prophet and a prophetess is? One wears a dress. Unfortunately, in some places, I would have to explain which one nowadays. But, the, but what I'm saying by that is I'm saying there's no difference, right? Because God can use, male in, in, uh, you know, in the kingdom of God and in Christ, there's no male, there's no female, there's no Greek, there's no Hebrew, there's... We know this, right? That there is, uh, that, so uh, women, you ought to be prophesying. And in the Bible, we see Miriam prophesying in Exodus 15, 20. Deborah did in Judges 4, 4. Huldah, my grandma's name, she prophesied, uh, we see prophe pro her prophesying in 2 Kings 22, 14, and 2 Chronicles 34, 2. Anna, in Luke 2, 36, was a prophetess. Philip's four daughters, prophesied in Acts 21, 9 through 11. Women in the Corinthian church, we see that in 1 Corinthians 11, 5. All believers, that encompasses everything, right? In 1 Corinthians 14, 31, the passage that we were just, some of the passages that we were looking into. And don't forget that even Balaam's donkey, he spoke, maybe not necessarily a prophetic word, but God touched him and gave him the gift of speech, right? So there's, uh, so God can use you. You're, with, you're not, you have no excuse. You're without excuse. If you're a believer, you have the potential to prophesy. It's just taking the first steps to interpreting and releasing the word that you have. Now, I've always seen that interpretation, and we'll talk specifically about interpretation uh, in the upcoming weeks, but interpretation is probably the most challenging area of a prophetic word. When God gives you a prophetic word, it is pure. It's from heaven. He sets it in your spirit. It's there. It's the word of God. Like I said, it's got filters. It's got to go through. Misunderstandings, hurts, wounds. And, it's, and so a lot of times if you've been given a bad word, it's very possible it was, or a hurtful word, it's very possible it was a misinterpreted word. That somebody really didn't understand what God was trying to say to you. You can grow in that. Amen? You can develop that. You do that by learning the language of the Holy Spirit. Learning what God is saying because you, you know the scriptures. And you know when God shows you something. That, uh, that the first place you can go to to find interpretation is the scriptures. And then there's other places. But we must learn the language of the Holy Spirit. So when I was... Just beginning and starting out in prophetic ministry, I remember being in the back of a church in a prayer group, and we had an, apost uh, an apostle. His name's Sam Matthews, and uh, he's just a phenomenal guy. He leads a network of churches that we were a part of, um, a true and powerful apostle. And he was there, and I, have, I had a lot of, uh, uh, just a, a lot of reverence, respect for this man of God, and he's in the back. And the Lord dropped a word in my heart. So I said, well, I'm going to release it. The apostle's here. My spiritual father, who's a prophet's there. Lord, don't let me mess this up. So I spoke out and I said, the Lord wants you to prophesy. And I said, just like he used Absalom's donkey, he can use you to speak. So prophesy, 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 I can't remember, it was years ago, I can't remember everything that I said, but then I, dawned on me, it wasn't Absalom. I've actually made that mistake too many times, i got to get that right. It wasn't Absalom, it was Balaam. Absalom is David's son that hung around a little bit. So I thought, I can't believe this, because I had done this, I had, and, and I was still coming out of, old thinking. 
So I'm thinking, now the apostle thinks I'm a false prophet. And now the prophet thinks I'm a false prophet. Surely I'm going to be kicked out of the church. I didn't know what I was so. And I went up to Mike Monger. My, he's the one that raised me up in the prophetic. And I said, Mike, do, can you believe what happened? I'm so sorry. I don't know how that happened. And he said, what happened? I said, you don't know what happened? I got to tell you? And so I explained that to him. And he said, nobody noticed that. And it's not a big deal. He said, because, you know, when, when, when God is, he didn't share this with me. We had a quick meeting. But when God is releasing, it's like vibrations out of heaven that our spirit man has to interpret, you know. And so there are times where things like that happen. And we, we find out that we're still hearing God. And so I took, I took what he said, but I still kind of felt like, ah. And so I moved away for, I think, four years. And then we came back, and one of the men that Mike had raised up was pastoring a church. He asked me to be his associate pastor. So I went there, and I was talking to him, and he said, you know what, Chuck, I never used to prophesy. And he said, you remember when we were back in the prayer room, and you gave that word about Balaam's donkey? And I said, Absalom's donkey? Yeah, yes, I remember that. He said, after you gave that word, I've started prophesying, and I've never quit. He said, I continue to release the things of God when he gives them to me because of that word. And so you see, God still used that even, even in the simplicity of it and a, and, uh, a simple mistake, something that, that uh, you know, maybe some people thought you should be stoned for. And I know not in our day and time, but, you know, something that people would think would qualify you to be a false prophet, God still used it as a powerful force in this man's life. And we had a moment where I said, you know what, I, I struggled with that for years. And he said, well, it changed my life. And so this is, if you can understand that no matter what level you're at, stage you're at, depth you're at in the things of the prophetic, that God can use you profoundly, you'll begin to speak out. You'll begin to share. And so I didn't see it, but my spiritual father saw it. And I would give, I would give corporate words a lot, and they were well received. Um, even when I was like, you know, I'm talking about 23, 24 years old. And so when I was just starting out in this, and I would give out corporate words. And, and so he, he saw the prophetic in me, though, and he said, I, I'm going to prophesy for everybody after church. It was his, what he did every week. He would prophesy for everybody that would come up after church. He'd prophesy over them. He said, I want you to stand with me. I said, I'll stand with you. And he said, if you get something, I want you to share it. I feel like weeks went by of us just walking down this aisle. He'd give this profound prophetic word, tell people which part of the state they're from, you know, tell them this and this. And, and uh, he'd look at me and say, Chuck, what do you have? And I'd, uh, nothing. Next. Chuck, what do you have? Nothing. I felt like weeks went by where I had nothing for every person that we would minister to. But then, and I, you know what, I was... I was embarrassed, and I was struggling, but there was something in me that said, Lord, don't let him stop asking me to stand with him, because I believe something's about to happen. And so one day, this lady was up front. I think she was about the third person that we ministered to. He said, Chuck, do you have something? I said, I think I do. Now, it was just a little thing. It was like a little word, just like a little bit of encouragement, you know, and I said, uh, well, I've got this, this little thing. Uh, I shared it with her. She burst in tears. Something broke. Something lifted. Something happened with this little word that I had. But it triggered something. It started a flow that never stopped of, of releasing now words to the people of God. And once that happens with you, you'll begin to release things every opportunity you can. But hopefully you'll do it in a way that God had intended. 
that you release the prophetic in a, in a way that gives care to it. Because that's a powerful tool. I don't remember if I saw a picture of a bird or something and it meant something and something, and I, I don't remember what it was. It was so many years ago. But uh, when you have a, a word that simple and you release it and it just melts somebody's heart, that's a powerful tool. Amen? It's a powerful tool. And it's something that God wants to do through you. Gift is a better word than a tool. It's a powerful gift that God wants to release through you. And it will, it will touch people's lives. It will minister to people's lives. So it's, I just want to share, and I'm going to end with this. I want to talk about some guidelines to sharing a prophetic word in church. So this brings us to 1 Corinthians 14, 39 through 40. And the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, desire, earnest, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So this covers a lot, actually. It, it reiterates the fact that we should desire earnestly to prophesy. Paul says, do not forbid speaking with tongues, and let all things be done decently and in order. Now we have to realize the the group of people, the audience that Paul was writing to, it seemed like they were unbridled, right? We know that there was immorality going on. And some people were excited about it. Does everybody remember this, this story about the, the man with his stepmother and those things that took place? They're horrendous. But things were happening, and then it seemed like in the service there was no sense of order. People were all speaking in tongues at the same time as though they should all understand each other. And things were, were taking place and it seemed like, and this was Paul's opportunity to bring order to it. And I think in our day that a lot of ministers who would do that would say, why don't you guys just stop for a while? Take a break. Take a prophecy break. Let's give it a few months. We'll come back to it. Visit it later. No speaking in tongues for a while, all right? I think that would happen. Paul never does this. In fact, if anything, he lights more of a fire to the kindling, right? He's, start, he's starting, he's encouraging them more, but he's encouraging them in a way that is decently and in order. Because that makes the prophetic more effective. It makes, it, and, and uh, it's released in a way that is even more powerful, effective, and care is given to it. He doesn't ever try to stop them. He simply works with the church to make sure those gifts fulfill their purpose. So I've had an opportunity to see a lot of situations that were done and they were not decent and they were not in order. So in 1 Corinthians 14, the Holy Spirit and Paul lay out some important guidelines for prophesying in a local church. And I believe that these, I know that these guidelines apply to both personal but then corporate prophecy as well. So do you understand what, what I mean when I'm talking about that? When I'm talking about personal prophecy, that's when somebody comes up to you and says, I've got a word for you. Corporate prophecy is when somebody comes up and says, I have a word for the church. And so these few things that I'm going to discuss right now, they apply to both. So the first thing, it says, the Bible says, let two or three prophets speak and the others judge. I think I've told you about this before, but I've been around long enough where you've probably heard most of my stories a few times, right? So anyway, but I remember I was at a church that now they call themselves Antioch Center. And you can just tell they're cut from the same cloth as Antioch International. It's, a, it's in Mandan, North Dakota, and we used to attend there. But the first time I went there, um, I was actually just holding something in my heart for a while. I wanted to get to know the people before I released a prophetic word. I wanted to, to become a trusted member, you know, and I wanted to just build relationship. Um, but finally one day the pastor said, Chuck, you've got something in your heart. Why don't you come up and share it? And so I said, okay. And so I got up and I prophesied and everybody seemed excited about it. And he, I was going to sit down. He said, no, stay there a second, Chuck. I said, okay. What happens after they prophesy in this church? And he said, he called three people to stand up. And they all stood up. And he said, in this church, we judge prophecy. 
He said to the first person, how do you judge this word? Thankfully, the person judged it accurate. And he asked the next person, he asked the next person. Now that's on the spot judging of the prophetic word. And I, it's, it's a unique way to do it, but it was effective. I'll tell you, if I had any other motive but then just to bless the church, um, it could have been a bad experience. But he was, he was watching out for his flock. He was caring for his flock and engaging others in the process of judging prophetic revelation. It's important. We're all a part of it. So it says, let two or three prophets speak and the others judge. Now this is where young prophets can be dangerous. Because sometimes you get the idea, well, I have heard God. These are the kinds of people that say the word God in three syllables, you know. I have heard God. I have heard God. Who can tell me different? Really, you're going to argue with God? No, no. But we might look into your interpretation of what God is trying to tell you. We might help you with that. We will judge that. Sometimes with certain individuals, you do need to judge what's coming out of their mouth completely. There's no God to it at all. But there's, uh, there's times where you're, you're just helping them to see what they're actually hearing. And they may, they may be misunderstanding. And so you help them by judging it. So Paul gives us this guideline. And one of the things, he kind of gives a guideline of how many people should speak during a given meeting. Now because of the fact that he says two or three, I don't think that it's a hard, fast rule. It's my own opinion. But he says two or three. In other words, um, there should be, when prophetic is happening in a church, there should, it shouldn't take over the whole service. God's got other things he wants to do. Amen? And so two or three might prophesy, or well, you know, how the apostolic leadership feels led. But, uh, so he gives some direction to that. But also he says that these things need to be judged. They need to be judged by others. Now, that's important because it's, a, it's uh, in personal settings, when personal po- prophecy is being released, do you know that needs to be judged as well? Sometimes we think that we just have carte blanche to just release prophetic words over everybody without taking any concern to the scripture. But the Bible's clear that it needs to be judged. In other words, somebody else has got to hear it. So we used to call these parking lot prophecies. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you'd walk by some people in the parking lot and they're giving each other glory, prophetic words in the, and it, it's not about the location. It's not about the parking lot. You're going to have a whole church service in the parking lot. God bless you, right? But it's about not wanting other people to be around. And I remember that same time frame when the Lord began to speak things to me. I learned a lot in those years. And I remember uh, I was, a woman came to me for a prophetic word. I didn't really have anything for her. But she said, you've got a prophetic word for me. I said, oh, do I? Okay. That's always exciting when somebody else tells you. And she said, but yeah, let's, don't give it to me here. Let's go back in this back room. And I said, I did the snap like this. And I said, no way. <laughs> no, we didn't do that back then. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing that. It's dangerous, right? Because it's in those types of settings that things are prophesied and released that that can cause harm to the body of Christ. It needs to be judged. Other people need to hear it. Let the others judge. It's mandatory for personal and public prophecy. So if you have a word for somebody after church, it happens. God's speaking to you. The person sat, sitting right in front of you all through church, you've you got this picture of them, you know, doing something for the Lord and with this fire in their heart, and you're just sitting there with it, and at the end of church you want to, want to release it to them. We'll do it. But grab a leader. Say, will you judge? Will you listen? As I, will you pray with me? Any of those, you know, just communicate to them that you want them there, and that's a safe environment. It keeps things decent, and it keeps things in order. It's important for accountability as well. 
I've heard of a well-known prophetess that was going from place to place and sorry about that it's loud and one of the um, and one of the ladies that had received a word from her went to the pastor and she said something to the effect of this woman prophesied to me that I'm going to start a counseling ministry so where's my office going to be in the church and the pastor said I don't have an office for you in the church I don't know what you're talking about she didn't share that with me so he called this prophetess and he said, what did you say to her? And she said, you know what? I never prophesy without recording it. So she got out the recording. No, no sense of that was in the prophetic word. But she had gleaned that because of what her own heart was hungry after and what she was desiring after and what maybe God was wanting to do in her life. But it wasn't, it wasn't being confirmed by that prophetic word. And so that added, you know, those of you who have come on, a Friday night, and we have prophetic ministry up front, we always record it. Part of that is so we can send it to you. And so you can have it to remember because we wage warfare by the prophetic words that are given to us. Amen? Another reason is so in case somebody says we said something we didn't say, then we can say, well, let's listen to it again. I've got prophetic words from a while back. You know, I keep them for a while, then we get rid of them. But it's, uh, it's, it's something, it's an accountability. So it's important to have somebody there. This is a personal policy. I never prophesy over a child without their parents present or without the word being recorded, and I make sure that gets to the parents. Um, and the, but the first is preferable, that the parents are there. Now sometimes I'll give it to the parents. I don't know how many, J Jesse and Liz getting texts from me, some seasons, a lot of times, with a word for one of their children. I give it to them. And then there are times where they say, Chuck, this needs to come from you. Will you read it over them? And I say, yes, and I read it over them. Why? But, it's, but it's important that they know. Why? Because, because this is the fivefold ministry. It's teamwork. All right? The prophet does not stand alone. But we work together. So if you release a prophetic word, you understand that somebody else is going to be pastoring that prophetic word. They're going to help to pastor it in that person's life. All right. And then corporate settings. We talked about personal settings, corporate settings. Some of you are at a place where you're growing in the prophetic, and you may be receiving revelation for the entire church. You can receive a word for the whole group of people. Uh, if you have that type of word, it's always right to release it to whoever is the leader of that setting. So on a Sunday morning, you go where? Dr. Wins. Some of you just aren't going, and you're not going, for the, you're not going for the wrong reasons, you know? It's, you're fearful. You know, you're, you're unsure. You don't want to be turned away. But if you come, if you share, if you release, it gives that word an opportunity to be reviewed by, on an apostolic level. It gives you an opportunity to gain feedback at some point. It gives you an opportunity to grow. So I'm encouraging you to come. And I've already talked to Dr. Wins. I said, is it all right if I encourage them to come to you? He said, please do. Because there's, there's more prophetic that needs to come from the body. Amen? Now sometimes we think if we don't share it up front in a microphone, it means nothing. But that's not true. I can't tell you how much God is showing me how the prophetic works behind the scenes. How sending a text to, somebody, to, uh, to Dr. Wins and saying, the Lord told me this. You know, he doesn't just delete it. He takes it into account. Sometimes somebody else sent him the same thing, so it's got confirmation. And so we think because we don't have the spotlight on us, we're up front. Some of us think this. And we're not up front that it's not valued. And that's not the case. Because God does powerful things behind the scenes. Amen? All right. And so, and one of the problems is, is that prophetic people, believe it or not, they're very sensitive people. No. And so if you're not allowed to share a word, the first thing we think of is, I've been rejected. Rejection is an enemy of the prophetic ministry. It's something that targets the prophetic ministry. A spirit of rejection does. Ask 
Elijah when you see him, and you will one day. Ask Elijah. He'll tell you, yes, rejection will come against you. But what we have to understand is it's not a rejection that's taking place. But there's a lot of reasons why uh, that prophetic word may not be appropriate for that day. When, when the apostle of the house, the father of the house, has an understanding of everything that's going on for that service for any given day, he, he, he knows which prophetic utterances would add to that and give it momentum for that given day, and those other things which would actually take, would, would move the service in a direction that the Holy Spirit is really not leading. So one of the things we ask ourselves is when we receive a prophetic word, the first thing you ask yourself, note this down if not on a piece of paper in your mind, the first thing we ask ourselves is, is this for me or is it for the church? Even on Sunday when I shared a, a prophetic word up front, there was a, a whole second aspect to that word. And as I prayed and I asked the Lord, I said, that part's for me. And I kept that for me. But I knew the rest was for the house. And so, so I, I'm learning and growing in that because there was a time where I would have just brought the whole works. You know, and said, this is... A, but you learn to discern what's for the house and what's for me. And so the longer that uh, I'm in the prophetic ministry, the more I realize that a lot of this is done behind the scenes. Something sent to the, the pastor in private, it's shared privately. Uh, these moments can be incredibly powerful and meaningful. Prophetic words are often then shared with they're shared as insight to the intercessors. They bring confirmation to decisions that were made by church leaders. And they can be very effective in a number of ways. So this is something also to make mental note of. Because I'm really believing that after these four sessions, maybe even after tonight, you're going to begin to pro prophesy more. I hope that happens. I really do. And so... And as you do it, step out boldly because you've determined in your heart you're going to do things decently in order. So on Sunday morning, you go to Dr. Wins. If it's Antioch worship night, you go to myself, to Ed, to Bruce. Jesse, who is the government of that meeting, is playing guitar. Don't go up to him when he's playing guitar. He might break another string. We don't want that. He's only got so many guitars he can fit up there. He's a great guitar player. But... Uh, but so he's, he's asked us to listen to those words. And Friday nights, I'll tell you this, is a, a place where we are hoping to raise more voices up. So it's going to be an opportunity where you m maybe weren't comfortable on a Sunday and maybe something that you have to share you wouldn't share on a Sunday. But because we're recognizing people are developing and at different levels, bring it on Friday night if you have a word. Because it's, it's, it's worship and prophetic night. And so you'll have opportunities to share. If you are at a home group, you go to the home group leader. You say, I've got this. I feel like it's all for the whole group. If you have a word for a family, you go to the father. Or if there's not a father present, the mother. You know, you, you share it with. That, that amount of understanding of government will save you from a whole ton of heartache. It will. And it will give you boldness because you know you're trying to do things right. It'll give you boldness to begin to step out and to release the words of God to people, to release something powerful. Well, let's stand together. Now, in the upcoming weeks, we're going to have some activation because I always have activation when I teach the prophetic. So, what that, so next week, uh, Dr. Wins is going to be uh, finalizing his dream training. But then after that, we're going to do activate, some activation where I either have you pair up or get in groups and you're going to minister one to another. It's very effective because it, it gives you a small group setting where you can be confident and step out and just share. And it's not so overwhelming with a whole group of people. And then on the last night, we're going to be ministering to all the youth to stir up the prophetic in them. I feel like that's something that God wanted me to do in this season. Stir up the prophetic in the children and... Uh, the young people and the youth. So, amen. Who's excited to prophesy? Amen. amen. Now, you know if you have a word for your, 
Wives, if you have a word for your husband, it's all right to share it with your husband, right? <laughs> you don't have to call the pastor and say, I had this word for my husband, can I share it with him? And husbands with your wives, and parents to your children, I mean, that's your sphere of authority. So, all right. Chuck just gave all the wives permission to prophesy to their husbands. What happened? Let's close in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask you to do something different tonight. I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your stomach. The Bible says, out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water. And Father God, by that you met the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit flows, he flows in a number of dynamic ways, powerful ways. Gifts of healing, um, supernatural, powerful, mighty ways, Lord God. And gifts of prophecy, tongues, interpretation. Lord God, that's all in us now. Everybody say, that's in me now. The prophetic is in them now. You are a prophetic Holy Spirit. You're not going to stop being prophetic. So if you're in us, it makes us prophetic. And you are in each one of us, Lord. And so I pray in the days to come that you would stir up such a prophetic anointing in each person here. Lord God, that they would go boldly into situations, having seen it already in the Spirit, knowing the outcome, confident in you, confident in your ways. Lord God, I pray that we would see, Lord, uh, see into the Spirit in remarkable ways, Father God, that we will be bold in the things of God and run to the battle just like David because we know Goliath is going to fall. We've already seen it in the Spirit. Lord God, just bless each person. Stir them up in the gifts of the Spirit. Stir them up in the prophetic in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Greet one another as you go, and God bless you. Thank you so much.